As everyone knows, fire in its proper place is useful and comforting. But on the rare occasions when it breaks loose, it can do immense damage. Just a nice, peaceful picnic. Hubby's lit his fire in what he thinks is a safe place and goes blissfully on his way. Just a peaceful picnic. No, it never pays to be careless. Fire leaves waste where there was wealth. To prepare against carelessness and accident, the men of the Forest Service are always active with precautions, clearing fire breaks and checking on valuable reserve water supplies. Though last summer was dangerously dry, damage by fire was less than in previous years. The Director of Forestry has reported to Parliament that this commendable state of affairs is due primarily to a responsible and fire-conscious public. New farming techniques make the burning of scrub and tussock an outdated practice. A good top dress of superphosphate and clover seed from the air is more profitable than a burn. Gorse and scrub can also be dealt with without fire. Pines planted on cleared strips will eventually overshadow gorse and suppress it. Ultimately, New Zealand need have no wasteland, only pasture and crops. Homes, gardens and timber forest. Reserves for water catchment. And reserves for the recreation of that fire conscious and responsible public who've been thanked for their care by the Director of Forestry in his annual report to Parliament. Most of the shearing gangs in Hawke's Bay are Maori. Here at four in the morning, one of the gangs arrives at Mason Ridge Station. Eric Tahu, the ganger, stops the truck and all climb down to have a look at the whare. It will be their home for the next week or so. Five o'clock and time for shearing to start. The gang make their way to the shed. Spady sharpens the blades and soon hand pieces are set and ready for use. Mrs. Tahu, Eric's wife, is passing today. It is the custom here for the wool classer to start the motor. The blades are working and the sheep are waiting. Next, please. Adam, number one sharer, gets down to work. Young Johnny, Eric's son, and Spady are hard at it. Eric finds it hot going. Adam is a good shearer. He can get through over 200 sheep a day right through the season. Most of the shearers do farm work all the year round. Nine months of the year is spent with sheep, shearing, docking, dagging, and all the seasonal work. For the rest of the year, there's always fencing and the other odd jobs for which the farmer needs to hire labor. From the sheep's angle, sharing doesn't seem too pleasant. Quarter to ten is smoking. Today is sunny and the gang sit outside. Little Ra gives the pet lamb his morning milk. Wira and owner play drafts and Eric offers a word of advice. Back to work. Adam's wife, Rudia, brings a fleece to the sorting bench. Up it goes, and even before it lands, the fleecers are busy sorting and skirting. We're a light sharing time. It's hard work, but good pay and good fun. She'll be sorry when it's over. (laughs) 
And here's Mere, Mere Karajiana. Her busy fingers have grown used to this sort of work over several seasons. When the fleece is sorted, classed and ready for pressing, Mrs. Tahu carries it to the bin and says hello to little Gail Turry. Gail's father, Lemon Turry, is kept busy in the presser. Marking time in his job means hard work. Five o'clock and the last sheep for the day is cut out. The gang are weary now and make their way slowly to the warren. The end of a hard day. Tomorrow, another hard day. A week and Mason Ridge will be cut out. Then they'll hit the road for the next station. Twenty-five thousand items daily of glassware for practically every purpose are turned out at this factory at Hornby near Christchurch. To make a jug, take a dollop of molten glass, snip it off into a mould and force in a plunger under pressure. Split the mould and out comes the jug. This automatic press can turn out a variety of items according to the moulds used. At the moment, it's tumblers at the rate of 3,000 dozen every 24 hours. Man and machine combine to send the hot tumblers into the annealing oven to slowly cool down. Stenciling on fancy designs in ceramic colours is a job that calls for rhythmic coordination from three pairs of hands. The main ingredients for making quality glassware, silica sand and lime, are readily available in New Zealand. Brought from overseas, a team of traditionally trained glassblowers turn this into a variety of everyday articles. A lampshade starts off as a blob of glass from the main furnace, which is first blown into a small clear bubble on the end of a long blowpipe. Now the pipe's dipped into a smaller furnace for a coat of opal glass. The bubble's enlarged and moulded in a wooden shaper. From the first dip to the finished article, the pipe is constantly rotating. It's hot work, this glass blowing. It takes three weeks to get the furnace up to its working heat of 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. The blowpipe's dipped in for a final coat of clear glass, sandwiching the opal between two clear layers. And now the blower shows his skill as he blows and waves the molten blob into shape and drops it into the mold. Still attached to the blowpipe, the lampshade's carried away to the annealing oven. A touch of cold water at the junction, a gentle tap, and the shade awaits the next process. These moonstone shades now have the base cut off to allow for a crystal insert. Gas jets play on the rim, touch with a diamond, and off it drops. After testing for flaws, the rough edges are taken off on a grindstone. The work of craftsmen from Central Europe, whose skill has been handed down from father to son for generations, this hand-blown glassware is yet another useful contribution to New Zealand's growing range of national industries.